Welcome to week four of our study of the gospel according to Matthew. I'm here in the LAX airport and hoping that the background noise isn't going to be uh, too distracting for you to be able to track with me. I've already had to start this over one time and I think if I get another announcement I'm just going to keep going. Um, I'm on my way, uh, as it turns out, to Tel Aviv today uh, to spend about 10 days uh, in and around Jerusalem, Tel Aviv, also some time in Palestine and the West Bank, in the occupied territories. Uh, in connection with what you might describe as a Israeli Jewish think tank, so I'll be with a sort of cohort of Christian scholars engaging with Israeli Jewish scholars on questions of uh, Jewish law, Jewish tradition, its relation to the Christian tradition, and how this has played out in the sort of uh, politics of the modern state of Israel uh, for good and for ill. So um, I'm hoping that I'm going to be able to make a couple of videos, short videos, in and around Jerusalem. I doubt I'm going to be able to get uh, up to the Galilee, um, but maybe some short videos in and around Jerusalem that could show you some places where some of the events narrated in the Gospel according to Matthew took place and offer you some uh, kind of local commentary that way. But this gives me a chance to um, direct your attention to something that I think is of abiding interest to us in this class and beyond and will be the subject of a lot of our discussions this week. And it is the, the place of the Torah, the law, in uh, the Christian tradition, um, how that has affected Jewish-Christian relations. I think, uh, as has been clear in the forums, many of us realize that we've brought uh, a very sort of truncated understanding of the law uh, to our reading of a book like Matthew. And I just want to remind you that the law is not simply a list of rules, it's also stories. It's not just a list of rules um, that can't be kept, but um, also uh, a uh, series of provisions for what happens when the law is not kept. And overall I'd say that it's important to construe the law as a living organism. Uh, it's not something that is sort of uh, dead in the past. The meaning of its words uh, grows with time through the various circumstances in which those words find their practical meaning. And as such, the law is not something I don't think that we can say uh, that Jesus is merely trying to restore. Um, it's not a set of timeless standards that have been forsaken and Jesus is simply trying to get Israel to um, return to go, return to some original state of pure obedience or something. Uh, instead, I would say that Jesus is certainly trying to correct misuses of the law that have become rampant in his day under the current authorities. But at the same time, he is bringing out... Um, possibilities for what the law means that are pregnant in the law but have not been made explicit until the dawning of the kingdom of heaven and especially the power of Jesus. So that's uh, hopefully um, a way to help you conceptualize the law and we'll have ongoing conversations about this. There will be more secondary reading about this um, outside of the commentaries that you're already wrestling with that I hope will um, increase your learning. Um, along these same lines as we deal with uh, some of the complexity and perhaps uh, some of the poverty of our own tradition as we come uh, to the Gospel according to Matthew, I, I just want to um, urge you all to be patient with yourselves and um, be uh, patient with what you might say is the inevitable uh, difficulty and complexity of negotiating the inherited patterns and structures of our life as we try to take Jesus' commands 
to us seriously. Um, as I've said to many of you, and as I said in my own remarks last week, I don't think that the sermon communicates an impossible ideal, um, but it is, as Jesus says, a, a sort of narrow way and will require perseverance, not only for us in this sort of compromised state, you might say, in which we find ourselves structurally, politically, economically, etc., but this was also the case for the people that heard this sermon. Um, they were in many ways weakened by all kinds of structural disadvantages, and Jesus is not holding over their heads uh, some uh, impossible standard for them to try to strive for. Uh, I think that Jesus is empowering them by showing them what is possible and uh, conveying his own power as a way of enabling them to see through his words what is possible and to pursue it. Don't forget that what's at the heart of this sermon is a prayer. And however we're going to try to be more faithful to what Jesus has commanded us, I hope that you'll see that it flows out of a practice of prayer. Uh, words that Jesus has given us that can become a sort of pattern for other words that we'll say in prayer. And however compromised you might find yourself, uh, you have been given these words by Jesus uh, to pray. And so to lean into a future that is difficult perhaps uh, for us to see. Also, make sure that you give the rest of the, the narrative a chance to unpack in some ways a lot of what Jesus is teaching. His own life, uh, as it unfolds in Matthew, is going to embody what his words are saying already. And uh, so we will gain clarity, I think, on uh, the calling of our life as disciples, receiving this teaching of Jesus and being called to convey it to others as a way of forming the, the people of God. We, we will see uh, clearly, more clearly, um, what that's going to entail as we follow Jesus uh, through the narrative. Not least um, through these uh, next sections that we have for this week that reveal the power, the authority of Jesus and uh, segues directly to his next discourse of teaching, what's often called the mission discourse. I uh, want to make sure I point out for you what you may have missed, which are optional resources. That's how I've labeled them at the bottom of each section of Moodle. Last week, for example, there was a, a difficult sermon that I uh, came up with for uh, my dear friend when his 37-year-old uh, brother uh, died of a bad dose of heroin. Uh, it was a tragic situation, um, uh, especially for his family for a variety of reasons. His family is half Jewish. Um, my friend is a Christian, just very messy, and um, the optional resources are meant to give you uh, a look at uh, things that are out there that I think will help you, but also ways that I'm struggling in my own life to make sense of Matthew's words and to use them. Um, you can use uh, those uh, optional resources. I invite you to avail yourselves of them and hopefully uh, get some sense of how I myself, in, in various contexts of life, am trying to make sense of what Jesus is saying. Uh, something I, I neglected to mention in, uh, with respect to the, the difficulty of embodying what Jesus is teaching, but especially the difficulty of understanding the words of this story in a context which perhaps we feel uh, many of us has been characterized by a lot of false assumptions, uh, a lot of um, distortion, uh, perhaps a very narrow uh, view of what the Christian life is about. And I think, uh, understandably, many of you are longing for some uh, clearer rules, shall we say, for how to get it right, how to hear what the story is saying rightly. And I think that's healthy. Um, but I just want to caution you because I think the knowledge um, that is reading the Bible well uh, is easily misconstrued in our time as a kind of technical knowledge. Some of you have heard me talk about this before in other classes, but technical knowledge might be the, the kind that is required to uh, learn 
maybe even a complex kind of technology like an automobile and uh, the technical knowledge that's required in this case to operate that kind of technology you can learn how to drive a car in three or four days there's a basic sense of the rules of that technology the rules of the road and um, you might not be the greatest driver after three or four days but you can do pretty well the Bible's knowledge I think is is quite different there are technical aspects but um, fundamentally we're talking about a deep practical wisdom uh, that is required for understanding what the Bible is saying so there's certainly some technical literary considerations perhaps some historical information that's helpful but at bottom I just want you to see that we're talking about knowledge that's better understood say as a, a practical kind of knowledge like the knowledge of playing a musical instrument you can't learn how to play uh, the piano in two or three days the way that you can learn how to drive a car in that time and that's because the kind of knowledge that playing the piano requires involves the subtle and slow transformation uh, of your body as well as your mind it requires um, a lot of practice it requires a lot of trial and error it requires the ability to observe others and imitate them to experiment to fail to try again and learning to read the Bible well in my view is somewhat like that kind of knowledge and so be patient with yourselves um, certainly we want to look for helpful rules to guide us in playing the music of the biblical words here the words of Matthew as well as we can but you should know that um, the rules for this kind of knowledge are not um, usually uh, very easy or easy to define um, they are rules of thumb but then there are all kinds of complexities that the rules themselves can't always prepare you for and that's the kind of task that you're faced with in making sense of a work like the the gospel according to Matthew and the way that it conveys the knowledge of God uh, to our lives so bear that in mind and as you'll see my approach in the face of that kind of challenge that kind of knowledge is to um, to be as sensitive as we can to the actual features and words of the text that we're reading and uh, so I don't think that's a silver bullet that fixes everything but I think that any good reading of Matthew will usually be characterized by a lot of textual sensitivity and subtlety and so that's what I'm going to be encouraging you to be guided by trying to direct your attention to and so one of the key rules for me is we're trying to decide what are good interpretations what are bad interpretations um, is how well does this particular interpretation wrestle with the details the framing of the text itself one last uh, item that I want to draw your attention to just for this week as a new development kind of hermeneutically in the course we often talk about the importance of context for understanding any um, biblical writing so the terms I think of context though are often not nuanced enough and I want to introduce two terms for context uh, this time those two terms are narrative occasion and narrative location narrative occasion and narrative location the occasion of a particular passage in the narrative is what immediately gives rise to it so you'll see I de devote a lot of attention in my remarks and some of the study questions to the occasion of the mission discourse at the end of chapter 9 which is the decisive uh, rejection of Jesus's power by the most trusted guardians um, of the law and covenant life of the people in the land and then the prayer of uh, that Jesus tells his disciples to offer for laborers in the harvest that God's kingdom is already generating in the land um, that occasion is key to making sense of what the force and the content of that mission discourse is 
Another one is the occasion um, in chapter 8, uh, verse 18 or so, um, of a great crowd of people that um, apparently causes Jesus to give orders to his disciples to go over to the other side. So this crowding around of Jesus all of a sudden is the occasion of the movement of the narrative to the other side. And we've got to try to ask ourselves what is being uh, conveyed by that sort of occasion. What does it tell us about the, um, the tensions at work in the story, but the meaning of the particular scenes that unfold from that occasion. Location, we'll come back to. It's a bit of a broader term. I sort of mean uh, what uh, a particular passage means in light of its situation in the whole kind of panorama of the narrative, the, the large sweep of the story. So by calling um, the mission discourse the second discourse of Jesus, I'm already giving a sense that this is um, the, the second of, in this case, five key discourses that kind of punctuate the narrative development of Matthew. Um, we could say something similar even about the location of the three stories that come on the heels of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, they immediately reveal the power of Jesus, uh, but their location as a sequence is also significant. Um, the location of the Transfiguration story um, is going to be important because of the way that it echoes the words of the Father in the baptism, and this anticipates um, what is going to happen at the foot of the cross and the words that we're going to hear there. So narrative location is more about trying to read a scene of the story in light of the broad sweep of, uh, of the narrative. So those are just two terms that are going to come up um, that I hope give a little more nuance to what we mean by pay attention to the context as you're reading a particular passage, a particularly difficult verse, um, in the Gospel of Matthew. Thanks for your patience with the distracting um, announcements and whatnot. Uh, I think that uh, our discussion is growing richer because we're beginning to see some of the challenges uh, for us in Matthew, not just in making sense of the text, but making sense of the text with the way that we live. And that is indeed finally the purpose of this gospel. It is to shape our lives as uh, communities of Jesus' disciples. Lord bless you as you work this week, and I'll be communicating with you uh, from Palestine.